Welcome to Behind the Story with American Media. I'm Sebastian Gomes. The Vatican has released its McCarrick Report, the result of a two-year internal investigation into the mishandling of sexual abuse allegations against former U.S. Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. If you need background on the report, watch this other video from American Media on the five things you need to know about it. But today, in this video, we're doing a deeper analysis for you and asking some of the unanswered questions, including where we go from here. And that's why we're speaking with Dr. Kathleen McChesney. We'll list her credentials, which are very impressive, in the description below. Uh, let me just give you a few of them, though. Uh, she was the first director of the Office of Child and Youth Protection at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. That was back in, from 2002 to 2005, after the sexual abuse crisis came to light in Boston. She's also a former executive assistant director at the FBI and a former sex crimes and homicide investigator. So you see why we wanted to speak with her today. So Kathleen, welcome to Behind the Story and thanks for taking the time to help us understand this McCarrick report. Well, you're welcome, Sebastian. It's good, good to be here with you. Now, just before we start, I want to encourage viewers to subscribe to our YouTube channel and comment below. You can also find really in-depth coverage of this story at americamagazine.org. Kathleen, this is a, a massive report, 461 pages done by the Vatican to tell the world uh, you know, what members of the hierarchy knew about McCarrick and their whole decision-making uh, process and trying to deal with him. Um, you've dealt with reports like this and done reports like this in the past, but have you seen anything like this from the Vatican before? What stood out to you on the surface of it when it, when it dropped uh, earlier? Well, clearly this is an unprecedented report from the Vatican, talking about internal matters that are so sensitive and had been protected for so long. I don't think people were really expecting the kind of clarity and transparency that was in this document. It's truly pivotal. And what's happened is that the Vatican has produced something that has set a new standard for how they're gonna be open with the laity. And because of that, I don't think that the Holy See can look back, look back at all and go back. Uh, everything is going to be better than it was before. Uh, they set the standard and now it's up to all of us to make sure that they continue to live up to that standard of openness and transparency. I'm wondering what you make of a, a re report like this that's done about the Vatican by the Vatican. Um, does, is there anything, any red flags that, that, that are raised for you in that regard? I mean, why should people trust an institution like the Vatican, which, which dealing with the cases that we're dealing with are, 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 are horrifying, why we should trust an institution like this to be able to do an, an investigation on itself? Well, that's a very good question and one that a lot of people have asked about the report itself. I think if you look at the substance of the report, you will see that there was a genuine honesty and, and transparency. The way that they conducted the investigation, the types of things that they did, the steps that were taken. And it's my understanding, although I'm not privy to um, the actual making of the report itself, that there was um, work done by external sources, people who aren't clerics, in other words, people who are experts who understand canon law who understand the structure of the church and who understand the the problems associated with clerical misconduct so i think that it's a trustworthy document i think that the references are done extremely well um, it's laid out in in the way that i as a former investigator would do an investigation of this size and i've been involved in a lot of large investigations of misconduct mm. The report tells us that uh, there were allegations against uh, McCarrick that were dismissed or thrown out or at least deemed not credible because they were anonymous. That's one of the things that the report made very clear. I wonder, wondering what you make of that and what does it tell us about, you know, the mindset of, of Vatican officials and of people working in the Vatican who knew about these anonymous allegations and seem to just have completely dropped the ball in that regard. There is a school of thought, uh, whether it's in the Vatican or in other organizations, that if an anonymous complaint comes in, 
that it's not fair to the person who's being accused because they, they, they can't confront their accuser. No one knows who the accuser is. And, and that is something that does need to be taken into consideration. However, when you're talking about something so serious as a criminal activity, uh, and in this case, criminal activity involving vulnerable adults and minors, an anonymous allegation has to be taken seriously. There are ways to, to get to the bottom of some of these. And when you have more than one anonymous allegation, that's you know the traditional red flag, that's the smoke. If you, you can't just look at the smoke and say, well, we're not gonna try to find the fire. You have to go beyond it. So in light of what you've, what you've read in the report, and it's still early, it's obviously, as I mentioned, a huge document to try to digest. Um, is there anything that, that jumps out to you as like, what is the cause, what is the root cause of the failure in the McCarrick case uh, from the institutional church? Is there something that jumps out to you? What jumps out to me is what's jumped out to me in so many of these uh, clerical abuse cases, and that's protection of the institution from scandal. Hmm. That that is the primary focus of the actions and decisions that were made. It, the primary focus was not on helping the person who was abused or finding ways to prevent future abuse by the offender. It was, how do we keep this from becoming public? Someone, this will offend the, the faithful. This will offend our donors. This will offend um, our reputation and, and impact it around the world. That should not have been the issue. And that appears to be the issue. I want to uh, ask you a follow-up question to that, which is going to be really difficult, I would imagine, to answer, but I think it's important to put out there. You know, the church is by nature hierarchical. We're talking about, about power, the abuse of power, a protectionism of the institution. The institution is hierarchical. I mean, this is, you know, Catholics believe it's divinely instituted as such. Um, that means that there's inherent power imbalances, right? Some people in the institution have more power than others. And yet, as you're saying, it was precisely an abuse of power, clericalism, uh, that's at the core of the McCarrick case. So, like, what's your advice or what, what are your thoughts about reforming an institution that is, by definition, hierarchical? Reforming institutions are, are, are very difficult. I think what, what you're probably looking for are some cultural changes to aspects of the institution. That, and in this case, you're talking about accountability and responsibility and transparency. Those are things that have to come from within the organization. They have to come from the top. You have to have a leadership that will commit the organization and bring all the members of the organization to the same mindset. And that is that we are going to be open and transparent, that this uh, the distinction in power should make no difference at all when it comes to abuse of persons, sexual harassment, verbal harassment, bullying, um, or, or the worst, sexual misconduct. There is no room for that when, when you have that uh, difference of power. As I mentioned before, you uh, spearheaded the implementation of the, the uh, U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People, and that's commonly known as the, the Dallas Charter, uh, which was created in the aftermath of the revelations of, of, of child abuse in Boston. Um, you know, you were involved in that. McCarrick was also involved in that and was also a great cheerleader of the reforms that that was, that, that that was bringing about. Uh, what do you make of that, that, that this report, you know, confirms that there's this person who in, in, historically has been a cheerleader for the type of reform that we're all looking for, and yet he himself was uh, a perpetrator of the, of the very abu same abuse? Well, we have found it through the research uh, and, the, and the various cases involving persons who abuse, they can have various aspects of their personality. And, you know, they're going to have a, a secretive aspect of their personality that they're going to hide that part of them that is bad and can be very gregarious, very, very kind, very successful, very giving, um, positive people and pastoral people. And 
if you read the report, you'll see that many people describe um, former Cardinal McCarrick as, as many of those things, a person who worked diligently, who was very pastoral, who spoke a number of languages, who understood uh, the ecumenical aspect of our faith. And so that's just, you know, we know this, that in all people, there are some good aspects. And he showed very many, a lot of good aspects uh, in his life, but he also had these bad aspects that he hid as predators often are very successful at doing. Hmm. I want to turn to uh, one of the questions that's unanswered in the report, and that has to do with um, accountability measures. Um, the report, even though it names many names, it does not impose sanctions or punishment on the people who are named, uh, and these are high-ranking Vatican officials, advisors to popes, and even you know popes themselves, Francis, uh, Benedict, and John Paul are all discussed in the report. Um, you know, what do you think the findings of this report now demand in terms of accountability? The I think the report itself is an is one part of accountability, and that's letting the public, letting the entire world in this case, know what happened. And so names are named, and, and that is, uh, that is a, a real big first step in terms of accountability. Like in most of the clerical abuse cases, a lot of the people who were involved who actually did something that was wrong, intentionally wrong, like covering up, some of those people are deceased. Many, in fact, most of the abusers that we know about, in the, at least in the United States, uh, are deceased. So um, if you're looking for that, that amount of justice, you know, going to jail, being uh, laicized, excommunicated, those, whatever the range of things that there be, you're not going to have that kind of accountability probably because it's been so long since these things have occurred. Although, although in, in McCarrick's case, I mean, we're talking about the 90s, the early 2000s with some of this stuff, and, and some of those people who are around the Pope uh, talking to the, or the Popes, I should say, uh, are still alive and are still around and are still Cardinals. Well, that's an excellent question. And that is something that the, the ultimate power person in all of this, a person to mete out any kind of justice vis-a-vis -vis accountability would be Pope Francis. And I would, not that he's going to ask me, but what might be a very useful thing for him to do is meet with his trusted advisors and talk about what options there are relative to accountability. And also, you know, you have to be, be fair and look at, at what, allegation you're talking about that, that was wrong? Was it a bad decision, which if anyone could make? Was it an intentional decision to um, do something that in the end perhaps caused other people to be abused? You mentioned Pope Francis. I, I wanted to ask you a question about him because the report does state that, um, you know, as early as 2013, which was the year that he was elected, uh, he had heard about some of the rumors about McCarrick, some of these allegations, uh, perhaps in passing conversations, that kind of thing. Uh, yet it wasn't until 2017 when an internal investigation uh, in the Archdiocese of New York actually found one of the allegations credible, and that is what led ultimately to the removal of McCarrick from the, from the priesthood, the College of Cardinals, and ultimately this report as well. Um, but but what, what, what do you make of that, that, that you know, Francis might have even heard about some of these rumors as early as 2013? Well, I don't know the substance of what exactly he heard, what he was told. Sometimes those two things, those two things are different. But I think the, the big lesson for all of this, whether it's for him or, or for any of us, is that, that rumors can be true. And when you're talking about the serious aspect of sexual abuse of minors and vulnerable adults, you have to follow them. You can't ignore a rumor uh, in, in this world. You ju just can't. This isn't like celebrity gossip or something like that. It, you're talking about people's lives, people's personal security. And it, in, when it's involving clerical abuse, you're talking about harm to a person's soul. 
and it's so serious and it, it's so important that those rumors be run to ground. So I think that's a good lesson for everybody in the church. You just, you just can't ignore these things. Mm. Speaking about Pope Francis, uh, you know, he, he's done more than any Pope, I guess, to date in trying to, to uh, you know, push more accountability uh, in the church itself. And part of that was uh, the creation of these, um, you know, guidelines for the universal church in a document called Vos Estes, which, um, you know, does a lot to try to not only, you know, say that we have to acknowledge these anonymous uh, allegations, but also there's there's now obligatory reporting and this type of thing. Uh, tell me about Vos Estes and how, th- like, how that could be a next key step in terms of imp- implementation uh, as a follow up to this McCarrick report. Well, Vos Estes is actually the the shortened Latin term for a motu proprio that that Pope Francis issued last year, and what this does is. It's a little bit confusing, I think, to many Catholics um, because you have to figure out what it means. But basically what it means, it's a Catholic bishop's abuse reporting system. And it's set up within the United States, a third party reporting system whereby people could go to an 800 number and report allegations of abuse committed by bishops uh, that they believe were committed by bishops or any kind of sort of uh, mishandling of a particular case. And then the cases are then um, coordinated with the Holy See, with the the, um, various dicasteries of the Holy See. And investigations are conducted here in the United States by the Metropolitan uh, or by another bishop uh, who directs that an uh, investigation occur. But the One of the key things about this is the investigations are conducted with professional lay persons. Mm. And so you're gonna get uh, uh, people who are independent of the church who are not involved in the hierarchy doing the investigations. And then there's another system to make sure that there's oversight that these cases do get handled and get handled in a timely manner. I think the church needs to do much more communication relative to uh, what that process is, this Catholic bishops abuse reporting system, I call it CBAR. People understand that more than they understand both estes, frankly. This report that came out from the Holy See gives uh, the USCCB, the bishops conference, it gives uh, all the uh, bishops and superiors around the country the ability to communicate again, once again, that this system exists and that people um, will not be retaliated against. In fact, they are welcomed to come forward with allegations that that they're concerned about and that those, and to know that those cases will be investigated by uh, external professionals. Mm-hmm. The measures, you know, uh, something like a motu proprio like Vos Estes is obviously hugely important uh, for setting a standard, right, and a procedure. Um, in speaking to some survivors, and we've heard this from 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 different uh, sectors of the church, that it's not uniform in terms of its implementation, right? So, like, there would be some some dioceses and bishops that take this very seriously to establish these procedures for for coming forward and reporting and 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 accountability and cover up to try to tackle that. Others might not be doing it as rigorously or quickly as uh, you know, as victims and survivors might expect, and the rest of us would expect. You know, what's your take on that, that, it, that it's, it's not a uniform implementation, even though it's you know, clearly setting a standard for the church going forward? Well, with 195 different dioceses in, uh, around the country, you might expect that there would be some places where the, the, uh, the system is not implemented as fully as it should be, or that it's not communicated as well within the diocese. Um, That is, I think, a really important issue for the Bishop's Conference to address. I think that if people do not think that their particular diocese or religious community are, are working with this system, they need to go to another one or they need to contact the Bishop's Conference with their concerns. 
sometimes implementing new pr pr programs like this do take time and, and there might be some um, rough spots in implementing it. But I would encourage people not to, uh, not to give up, to, to find the right outlet. Their church doesn't have an ombudsman program, although it might be a good thing to have. Um, but there are places people can go um, to find, find the answers and get the help they need. So if the USCCB were to, to call you, Kathleen, and say, okay, this report came out, what do we do now? What's your kind of immediate advice for them? Are you talking about the McCarrick report? I assume yes. you know, not yeah. a generic report, but the McCarrick report. Uh, certainly, I think that, first of all, it has to be unpacked because it, it's a very uh, lengthy document and has so many different aspects to it where it needs to be gone through to see if there are new procedures or policies that could be suggested or implemented or suggest things to, um, that might tweak uh, current um, processes and procedures and so forth. The fact that the Holy See is now understanding and recognizing that vulnerable adults, uh, seminarians, uh, people who are going through particularly tough times in their lives, counselees, that those people are very subject to uh, abuse by people who have more power than they do in the church, you know, whether it's in the church or in a seminary or, or just, just in general. So I think the document needs to be gone through and to find new practices, to find better ways of doing things. And then the, um, that would be coordinated, of course, with the major superiors and all the dioceses around the country. Uh, this is too important of a document to not let lessons be learned from it. Um, but I, I think at this point, we don't know what all the lessons that we might learn from it are just yet. One concrete measure that the bishops could take relative to the report and in conjunction with the uh, CBAR, the Catholic Bishop Abuse Reporting Program, is to do an annual report in the same way that they began doing annual reports that were an accounting of the number of allegations that came forth regarding clergy abuse. And CARA does that study every year. And those, those um, numbers are available to anyone on the website. That accounting is anonymous. And I would suggest that an annual report that includes the number of, of CBAR cases that come in and what their status is would be of value to the faithful, that you'd be able to understand that, okay, they implemented a system and here's what's happened in year one and here's what's happened in year two and so forth. And you can do that uh, with due regard uh, to the protection of the individuals involved, uh, especially the survivors. And then if there is a, a finding that according to Vosestes, you know, that will be uh, known if there is a, a finding that someone uh, did, a bishop did abuse, they are not going to keep that information secret. That will be, that will be conveyed to the public. I do want to acknowledge the uh, survivors in our conversation uh, here in this video, um, and not only, you know, the survivors that were abused by McCarrick, but survivors of clergy uh, sexual abuse everywhere. Um, you know, in light of this report, what can we say to them today? What we can say to, to those um, brave people, uh, whether they've come forward or not, there is a certain bravery among men and women, boys and girls who've been abused. Um, what we wanna say is that there are resources within the church, outside the church, to help victims of sexual abuse. Uh, things that were not available 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So that is a, a very positive thing. Um, also, you know, if people want to come forward, that's extremely helpful in terms of reducing risk, particularly if their fender is still alive. Um, it is really important to bring that information together. That said, not every person can come forward because it 
for various reasons in their personal lives or because they just do not want to. They have just are, are dealing with this on their own. And that's okay too. Um, people shouldn't be, feel like they're forced to come forward, but they should certainly feel like they will be, there will be gratitude when they do. Thank you very much, Kathleen. You're welcome. And thank you all for watching Behind the Story. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. And for complete coverage of the McCarrick story, go to americamagazine.org. For American Media, I'm Sebastian Gomes. We'll see you again soon.